when the Lord Jesus Christ was ready to leave and go back to heaven, he commissioned his church. Matthew chapter 28, beginning here in verse 18, and the Lord Jesus Christ is getting ready to go back to heaven. <clears throat> and this is what he says to his New Testament church. We know this isn't just to the apostles, or it would have died out when the apostles did. The commission would have died out. But the commission is something that is perpetuated. We use the word perpetuation, succession, and then continuity. Those three words all basically mean the same thing. And so here he is speaking to them. And Jesus came, verse 18, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And there, as the pastor said the other night, that's authority that he's talking about. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So we saw the Trinity manifested at his baptism just prior to his beginning his ministry, and now we see the Trinity manifested as he's getting ready to ascend back to heaven. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And so, we see here that the Lord promised his churches that he would be with them. That he would be with them until the end of the world. And so, we do have that promise uh, that he has given. Um, we gave out last night the trail of blood. I hope that you had an opportunity to look through it. The chart that is there in the back has been enlarged and is up here. And you can see, first of all, there was just one group. And then a big organization starts. And then it divides. There is a Greek Catholic Church and a Roman Catholic Church. The Greek Catholic Church still immerses. The Roman Catholic Church, which is centered in Rome, the Greek church in what is now Istanbul, it was Constantinople, but Istanbul, they still immerse in the Roman Catholic Church sprinkles. And so they just pour a little water on infants. And uh, supposedly, with the Greek Catholic Church, they're supposed to be believers, but that's not always the case. And so there's not a big push on that. But what we see here is that when a person is saved, they're to follow the Lord in New Testament baptism. And many have given their life. This um, size booklet was about this size, just a little bit bigger than this when it first came out. And, uh, you know, it was really a surprise. Um, Brother Clarence Walker is the one who started publishing this. Well, he didn't start. It was, it was another church in Lexington published it, published a thousand of them. And then they didn't want to publish any more. So Brother Walker got permission, and he began publishing it and advertising them through his church paper. <coughs> Today, there have been over three million copies of this book sold. And it really has influenced a lot of people. The Bryan Station Baptist Church is the one who prints it now. And they enlarged it so that it is easier for us to read. There's been a lot of assaults on this, a lot of attacks on this very book. And uh, I remember reading one, and um, this, this man was given these papers out, 
at a Southern Baptist Convention meeting several years ago, and he called it the Dead End Trail. That was the name of his paper. And he said he was upset because pastors in his area were giving this book out to their new members. And he said, actually, it's just a dead end trail. It's not a trail of blood. And so he was trying to demean the book. And then he began attacking the writer of it, who was J.M. Carroll, or James M. Carroll. Uh, Dr. Carroll had actually written a history of Texas Baptist that was about this big. So he was a scholar. He knew what he was doing. But he had uh, given these lectures in different places. And then they decided that they would put it in booklet form and they would sell them at a reasonable price. Uh, actually, I think Brother Walker was surprised because um, the book has been put in the Spanish language, the Portuguese language, Italian, Russian, and possibly others. It is now on the internet in at least three languages. And, as we said last night, it describes in brief detail a history of those who were the forerunners of what we now call Baptists, which were generally labeled Anabaptists because of their rebaptizing of those who were believers. And so, um, the Roman Catholics have not exactly liked this book. Now, I do want to say this. I know our pastor was raised as a, a Catholic, uh, Brother Thomas, Christina's dad, was raised as a Catholic, and possibly some others here. When we say anything about the Catholic Church, we're not attacking individuals. We're attacking and showing the error of the institution. And sometimes people get that confused. And they think, well, I know some good people who are Catholics, and you're attacking them. No, it's the institution and what they teach. And we're going to see tonight some of the things that they have taught down through the years and why we think they are so wrong and what, what the Scripture has to say about them. Now, I didn't get to this last night, but there are actually, there have developed two other views of Baptist history. One is called the Anabaptist kinship view. And what this view says is that our present-day Baptists were in some distant way related, but there wasn't any continuity, there wasn't any succession, no perpetuity. They just sprung up here and there, and in some way we have a kinship toward them. And uh, then there's another view and it's called the English Separatist view. And this view is that Baptists came out of the Church of England in England in the 1600s. It's been, um, well, 2009, it's been six years ago now, I was invited to write a paper and um, a man who teaches at a Baptist institution in the South a graduate school, graduated with Brother Bill, and he wrote me and asked me if I would write a paper on the successionist view of Baptist. And he said, we are celebrating the so-called 400th year of Baptist life. And those who generally believe in English separatism believe that Baptist started in 1609. Now, they kind of get in a squabble. Some of them say, well, 1611. Some of them say 1601, 1603. They really can't agree on the date where they say they came out of the uh, Episcopal or Church of England. But they believe they came out of there about 400 years ago. And then there's this other view, the Baptist kinship, spiritual kinship view. And he said... There are two other men who are writing views of this. So I want you to write the succession view, and I want you to write 15 pages. And I thought, well, that's going to be awful short. Well, one of them wrote seven pages, and the other one wrote nine pages. I had 
initially almost 35 pages and I kept cutting it down. I finally got it down to 17 and then they cut it down to 12. And I was kind of upset about that and I saw one of the editors not too long ago and I said to him, uh, he said, well, you wrote a paper for us. And I said, yeah, and you all altered it without letting me know about it. Oh, did we, he said. Well, surprise, surprise. And um, I said, yeah. He said, well, why didn't you contact us? I said, well, it was already published by then. And it had been published. And um, um, he said, well, I'm sorry to hear that. Well, that doesn't exactly mend the fence. But what I did was go back and put that whole article together plus the footnotes and it turned out to be about 35 pages and I have it on my website uh, under just the general Baptist history and so it is available there and there's just all kinds of information about historians who believed that we were successors of New Testament Baptist churches and uh, <coughs> I approached it by going through England. There is one historian who says that Baptists were in Wales in the year 63. And they were in England at a very early year. Maybe as early as 100. So, you know, in 15 pages you can't go through Wales and you can't go through England both. So I went through England and of course somebody's always going to criticize you if they prefer the Wales uh, addition. But, but actually, Baptists went both ways. And then they came to America from both places. They came, John Miles came from Wales and established a church in Massachusetts. John Clark came from England and established a church in Rhode Island. He was a physician as well as a pastor. And so they came from both places. So they did go into both countries and then they came over here. And so, you know, it's not a big argument. It's not something that anybody should get too upset about. But um, what you find out, and I've noticed this down through the years, sometimes we speak the same language, but we have different accents. You know, you talk to somebody from way down south. My dad was raised in northern Georgia, and we went down there one summer. And they kind of drag their language out a little bit down there. And up in Kentucky, we kind of clip it off a little bit. And the further north you go, the more clipping there is. And they talk a little faster. Sometimes I go up north and I think, my ears don't work fast enough to hear all this. But it is the same language. It's the English language. And so that's what we ought to realize and recognize. Um, one man who is especially recognized in our day was a man who was born in the late 1700s and he died in 1815 and his name is Andrew Fuller. And I, I have his, um, his set of works. When they were republished, I got them. And they're very valuable. And he, he said this. He, he has part of his diary in there. And he said in, 18, in 1781... I have been studying the history of English Baptists recently. And I found that Johann Mosheim was more correct than most people give him credit for. Now, Johann, or John is what we would call him today, John Mosheim is not an everyday word that we hear. He was a Lutheran historian. But even as a Lutheran, he recognized that the Waldensians and the Anabaptists had gone back 12 centuries from the time that he lived. And he stated that very clearly. And Mr. Fuller didn't write this down, in, didn't put it in written form until 1815. Now, if you take 81 and then go to 1815, you can see it's 19 and 15, what, that's 44 years that he studied church history. He was a very serious student. And what he finally came to the conclusion was 
these people who have been labeled as heretics by the Roman Catholic Church were wrong. That these people were not heretics. And the word heretic just means that they believe the wrong thing. They don't believe what is orthodox according to Scripture. And so Mr. Fuller made this statement and, and really uh, went into great detail. He said, there's little doubt that through all these dark ages, there were many thousands who stood aloof from the corruption of the times. Now, when we go back to studying, uh, sometimes our pastor will say antiquity. And um, I remember I had a graduate uh, professor at Austin P. University, and he was a medieval specialist. And you couldn't, you couldn't say medieval. You had to say medieval. And he said that over and over. He said, I catch you saying medieval, and I'll cut you off at the knees. It's medieval. Well, that was a period from the year about 500 to about 1500. And in 1515 is when Martin Luther rebelled against the Roman Catholic Church. He got upset there in Germany at Wittenberg because there was a man coming through town and he was going all over the place. He had been approved by the bishops to sell indulgences. And you say, well, what are indulgences? Well, he would come around and had his little collection pan, and he said, if you will contribute, you can sin without paying for it in a tormented way. You can pay for it now. And he was even selling indulgences before they sinned. Now, a lot of people like that idea. I think there's a lot of people today that like that idea. But what he did is he came into Martin Luther's town, and he was doing this, and Martin Luther ran him out. And then he protested because the Roman Catholic Church was approving this all over. They had men going around selling indulgences. Tetzel is the one who got the most credit and the most blame. But there were many others who were doing this. And the Roman Catholic Church had gotten so corrupt that they were just interested in more money and more money. And actually, as they appointed different layers of ministry, and they would have priests and bishops and archbishops and, I guess, super archbishops. I don't know how far up they went. But as they had all of these additional offices that they created, then they all wanted a small portion of this. Well, if I'm giving you permission to collect this, I ought to get something out of it. And they had to go to someone above them and get their permission. Martin Luther was a very dedicated Roman Catholic priest. He went to Rome hoping to see the most consecrated city in all of the world. He went to the Vatican. And as he sat on the steps of the Vatican, he saw prostitutes coming out and drunkards coming out of the Vatican that were stumbling over each other, and he was aghast when he saw this. And he went back to Wittenberg and he said, something's got to give on this. We're pulling out. And so he did pull out of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, at first he didn't intend to do that. He wrote what was called 95 Theses. And he listed 95 errors that he saw in the Roman Catholic Church, according to Scripture. And what he said was, we're going we're gonna to debate these. And as we debate these, and if we see that they're wrong, we're going to eliminate them. And that didn't go over too well. Actually, those who were in on the harvest Mr. Tetzel got upset, and those above him got upset, and the Roman Catholic Church actually put out uh, a hit list. They didn't call it that back then, but that's what we would call it today. I mean, he was a marked man, and some of his friends had to go hide him in a palace for a long period of time. And so finally he got out, and they removed the the censor of him, 
and then he started teaching what he considered to be orthodox doctrine. Now one thing that Martin Luther did not do, and all of those who followed him, a man named John Calvin, a Geneva Switzerland, a man named John Knox in Scotland, and these men became what, what we know today as Presbyterians. They, they sort of stepped halfway out of the Catholic Church, but they didn't get all the way out. And by not getting all the way out, they maintained infant baptism. They, they maintained efficacy in the sacrament of baptism and what they called the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper. And so they maintain these elements without getting completely out, and they thought that was orthodox. Well, one thing they did not like was the fact that the government had such control. The Catholic Church and the Church and the government of Germany were bound together. The Catholic Church and the government of France and the government of Italy, and the government of Switzerland, all of these were controlled by the government and the Catholic Church working hand in glove. And so Martin Luther thought, well, this isn't the right way to do it. And then he started seeing these Anabaptists around him. And at first, he thought Anabaptism was a good thing. He said, this is really wonderful that these Anabaptists don't kowtow to the government and that they just simply believe and practice their belief in a very simple way. Well, it didn't take him very long to realize that he wasn't going to get along with them as well as he thought he would because they weren't willing to compromise with him. And that's what Luther was demanding. He said, look, I've, I've stood against the Roman Catholic Church. They had stood against the Roman Catholic Church down through the centuries. It was a new thing to him, and so he felt like he ought to have some control over them. And when they said no, each church is independent. Each church is autonomous, and that means that the congregation is led by the Spirit of God, that Christ is the head of the church, each individual church. And there is no hierarchy or no superstructure. And Martin Luther did not like that. And before long, he had a little war with the Anabaptists. John Calvin, who many laud today for his, uh, his doctrinal uh, writings. He's written several books and, and has really studied the scripture. But he only got part of the way out of the Roman Catholic Church. He hung on to infant baptism. I was talking with a doctor several years ago, and um, he had been raised a Baptist. He went to a Presbyterian school, and he was living in the Cincinnati area. And I said, well, what Baptist church do you go to there? And he said, well, actually, we're going to a Presbyterian church. And I, I, I don't hide my feelings very well. I said, you are? And he said, yes. And I said, do you realize what they're teaching your children? They're teaching your children that the sprinkling of that child washes away their sins. He said, well, that is a problem. Well, of course it's a problem. It alters the whole way of salvation. Salvation is by grace, through faith, plus nothing. We just receive Christ as our Lord and Savior. And so to say, well, we're going to sprinkle children, and then when they get to a place where they can believe, then we'll confirm them in the faith. And that's what John Calvin was doing. I hesitate. I, I believe some of the doctrines that John Calvin believed. But I hesitate to call myself a Calvinist because John Calvin killed Anabaptists. Now, his cousin was a Waldensian. His cousin influenced some of his theology, which makes us come to a place where we believe that the Waldensians believe the doctrines of grace, which is what we believe. And Calvin promoted this. 
Actually, when Calvin got ready to marry, he waited until he was 30 years old, and he said to the men around him, I've been studying too much. I need a wife. <laughs> and so he started asking some men who a good wife would be for him. Well, a Waldensian man who had died, and his wife had two children. She was a very pure lady after his death, and she lived a very righteous life. And they recommended her. So he married a Waldensian. These were the people who had stood against the Roman Catholic Church down through history. So you get this interconnection here. Uh, her name was um, Adele D. Jeff, what is it? You, <laughs> I gave you a paper, I think, on it. And, uh, but anyway, Peru, I think her name was. And then Calvin. And... Um, Actually, she took very good care of him. I believe that she had some influence over him. His cousin, who was a Waldensian, had some influence over him. So there would have been some influence there. But the thing that we see, and, and this is what Fuller emphasizes, that there's reason to believe that among the Novatians, the Paulicians, the Cathari, the Paterans, and others who separated from the Roman Catholic Church and were cruelly persecuted or terrorized by it, there was a great number of faithful witnesses for the truth in those days. And so our heritage goes back beyond Luther. It goes back beyond Calvin. There are some today, and I can't really quite understand this, but there are some today who are calling themselves Reformed Baptist. And they say we believe the doctrines that... Um, John Calvin believed and he came through the Reformation and so we are out of the Reformation. Well, by putting Reformed in front of Baptists, they actually cut off their heritage. And you try to talk to them about it and they say, oh no, you just don't understand the doctrine like we do. But really, there is no such thing as a Reformed Baptist. We are called regular Baptists or missionary Baptists. And missionary Baptists are those who have taken the gospel to the ends of the earth as the Lord Jesus Christ instructed us. Now our time's getting away here, but I did want to emphasize, I, I mentioned that I was going to point out some things in Fox's Book of Martyrs. This book has 547 pages. This is an abridgment. Actually, John Fox, and his name is spelled F-O-X and F-O-X-E. You know, it's um, people spell names different ways, and so people have spelled his name two different ways. But he, in 1527, collected many of these biographies of people who had been tormented, of people who had been persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church, and he also tells us something about the Mohammedans. And uh, this is a little surprising in a way. He says Mohammed was born in, 15, in 570. He died in 632. But here was his message. And you don't see a lot of difference between the message back in the early 600s than you do today out of some Muslims. The sword, said he, is the key of heaven. He who falls in the fight, his sins are forgiven. His wounds shall be instantly healed, and he shall be borne aloft on the wings of angels. It was so disturbing yesterday to see how those people in France had been attacked. And then the question comes up, and all the commentators, I haven't watched a lot of it, but the little bit I've seen, they said, are we next? Well, we've already had a dose of it. And... Uh, they are going around to different places. But this is the way they proselyted, with the sword. When you get into about uh, the year 1000, we have what was called the Crusades. And this is um, a series of either 14 or 15, however you count them, uh, of pilgrimages that the Roman Catholic Church made 
to Jerusalem to try to free Jerusalem from the Muslims. They had come in and taken over and they were threatening to desecrate the whole city, and tear down all the shrines. Roman Catholics are so good at making idols and shrines. And uh, so they were threatening to do all of that. Well, the Pope instituted some of these crusades. The kings instituted some of the crusades. One, the one that's most pitiful, and, and here was the promise. Whenever they started a crusade, it was almost like Mohammed had promised. If you go on crusade, you will go to heaven automatically. It ain't so. This was a false promise. And one of those crusades was what has been labeled the children's crusade. And they went out and recruited small children down to preteens even and began marching across Europe to get to the Holy Land and they were attacked by bandits, by barbarians, by Mohammedans. Uh, it was just horrible the things that went on. And these children were abused and just treated terribly. And there were one crusade, they said it failed, so they just add the other one onto it. I had a course in the crusades. Uh, this one professor at Austin P. he knew everybody's first name, middle name, and last name that ever lived in the Middle Ages, I think. And uh, he told me one summer I was needing a class, and he said, if you'll come over to my house, we'll do a class on the Crusades if you want to do that. And I said, yes, I'd like to. So he assigned me readings, and I'd have to come and discuss them with him. Well, the thing that I found was real neat was when I would begin discussing it with him, with him, he would take over. He was so interested in it, and he would tell me the story. So it made it a pretty easy class, really. <laughs> if you can get your teacher to do all the work for you, it's a pretty easy class. Occasionally, he would stop and ask a question, so I had to know some things. But it turned out to be a very enjoyable class. And um, he was a very, I won't even describe what he's like. I've told him a few times in classes, and students always just break up. He, uh, he wore a purple shirt, orange tie, green coat, black pants, had glasses that thick. And his daughter brought his supper every night in a bag, and she threw it on the table, and he caught it. She was that arrogant. She was one of those hippie girls. And uh, he would sit there and eat his supper in front of us while we were giving reports. And almost always, they would, his wife would send him an orange, and he'd start peeling the orange, and it would start running down his sleeve. <laughs> and I thought that was a little amusing. I mean, it was an entertaining class in a lot of ways. But he was a knowledgeable man, and he understood what the Muslims were doing. And they were called Mohammedans back then. They didn't call them Muslim or Islam. They were Mohammedans. And they were very very dangerous people, the way they proselyted and the way they carried on. There was um, the Roman Catholic Church then took to persecuting and developed what they called the Inquisition. This was about 1200 when they started this, and um, if anybody didn't agree with their views, they would bring them into a court that they had appointed. Now. If you are appointed by someone and you're responsible only to them and they tell you what to do and you carry it out, that's not exactly what you call freedom of religion. And they persecuted countless people. They killed them, just tortured them. Uh, it went into Spain and we hear a lot about the Spanish Inquisition. And this lasted for about 200 years. And it was sort of a uh, clandestine thing. It, it wasn't advertised real big. And it was sort of undercover, but it was very effective in capturing people and trying to get them to uh, tell who were members of their group and who were the Anabaptists, and then uh, torturing them. So Fox tells a lot of this. You can get this from the library. 
Some of Christian bookstores sell a further abridged edition, and there are many, many tragic stories in here that I could read you, but we really don't have time. But um, they held the view that the Catholic Church was right and could do what it wanted to do. When, um, when many of these Baptists got to England, we, we have a real problem finding out who they were. And they, they had a, a, a king who decided he would rebel against the Roman Catholic Church, King Henry VIII. King Henry VIII had six wives. And one of them he detested, and probably some others too, I don't know. But one, he wanted the Pope to annul his marriage, and the Pope refused to do so. So he said, and he'd received an uh, honor from the Pope for being such a good theologian, he said, well, what I'll do is I'll pull out of the Roman Catholic Church, and I'll start a Church of England. And there's been a Church of England since the 1530s. King Henry VIII was the head of the Roman Catholic Church. I mean, the Church of England. He had pulled out of the Roman Catholic Church. He began persecuting Anabaptists right away. He put out decrees that they could not come into England from Europe. And you see recorded there in a paper that they had, some clerk in London, I believe, did this, but they would put out what they called a calendar of state papers. It was kind of like our congressional record. And in this calendar of state papers, they would say six Anabaptists were spotted at such and such a place. Two Anabaptists have come in from France. A small Anabaptist meeting house has been detected. Just very skimpy headlines on things like that. Then they would go after them. Henry wanted a son. The reason he kept divorcing these wives is they gave him two daughters instead of a son. So finally he had a son, and the son was very sickly. So when Henry died, um, his son, Edward VI, became the king, and he was just a teenager. But he was just as vicious as his daddy. And he started going after the Anabaptists. Then he got overthrown, and then Mary became, she was the oldest daughter of Henry VIII. She became the queen, and we know her in history as Bloody Mary. She killed thousands of people, and she took the Church of England back into the Roman Catholic Church. They killed her after five years, and then her sister Elizabeth I became the queen, and Elizabeth didn't like Anabaptists, but she didn't make any outward proclamations against them. But these are the kind of things that people had to endure back then. You know, we um, um, don't appreciate the freedoms that we have today. And uh, there was established there in England what was called the Star Chamber. And the Star Chamber was almost like what we would label a mafia mob. They were given judicial rights by somebody who had purchased those rights, and they said that nobody could worship outside the Church of England. Now, one of the things that the separatists talk about, those who believe in English separation of the Baptists, they say the Baptists didn't really come out in the open and start broadcasting and start declaring their doctrines and start setting up their churches all over the place until about 1639, 1638 and 39. Well, it's not easy, it's not hard for us to determine the Star Chamber was put out of business in 1638. They could no longer go after them after that. And so Baptists, Anabaptists did come out. Now there's one other thing, and I want to briefly cover it. Back in Germany, something had happened uh, back in the 1500s. 
And it was called the Munster Affair. Not like these monsters on TV, you know. It's M-U-N-S-T-E-R. But it was a town in Germany. And there were two men who were actually communists. And they said that they were Anabaptists. And all of those who followed them, they were cult leaders. All of those who followed them, they immersed them. But then, if they spoke out against them, there were reports of them putting women in cages, hanging them from trees, and letting the fowls come down and pick them to death. They would tie people on rails and just let them starve to death and let the animals devour them. It was a very vicious program. And all over, this went all over Germany, and it went all over England, and even came to America, the word about the Munster, Munsterite Anabaptist. And they really weren't Anabaptist at all. They were just called Anabaptist. And um, when um, they started coming out in England, the, the Anabaptists said, well, actually, we're just Baptists. We're not Anabaptists. And they said, see, they're denying their heritage. No, what they meant by that is, we're not Munsterite Anabaptists. And it got to the place where when they came to America at first, they would get off the boat up in Boston, and they would stand down there at the end of the, the uh, exit ramp and ask them, what is your religion? And if they said Anabaptists, they said, get over here in line. They'd get them in line and march them right back up the plank and send them back to England or Germany, wherever they came from. They, for years and years, Anabaptists were associated with Munsterites, and it was a terrible label to hang on. There is nothing wrong with the name Anabaptist, but to be a Munsterite was a horrible thing because they were cults, and they misled people. Now, there's one other thing that I want to emphasize and that's a man named John Leland. You've probably heard a lot about him around here. Actually, we have John Leland Baptist College. John Leland was born in Massachusetts. He went to Virginia as an evangelist, and he preached all over. He preached thousands of messages. He rode a horse and walked, and he helped establish churches. But he preached again and again. And finally, in his county, there were quite a few Baptist churches springing up. And there was a man named James Madison. And you've probably heard of James Madison, James Madison as being the author of the United States Constitution. He's the one that drew up that plan. And there was a question whether or not he was going to get reelected or not because there were so many Baptists in this one county in his territory that he was afraid if John Leland wouldn't come to his aid and stand with him if John Leland told the other Baptists to vote against him that he would get voted out of office and so they worked out a compromise and Adam said this we want this Constitution approved. Virginia has to approve it or it will not be approved. There were enough others, but Virginia was the key state. And John Adams was the key man since he had drawn the whole thing up. As it turned out, John Leland was the key Baptist man. And John Leland said this, and I don't think he was wrong in doing this. He said, let's make a deal. We will vote for you if you will put in the Bill of Rights, which are the first ten amendments to the Constitution. And the very first Bill of Right is religious freedom. And so the Baptists can be thanked that we live in a country where the government cannot tell us where to worship. I hope it stays that way. You know, they keep talking about changing the Constitution and shutting down churches. But John Leland persuaded his Baptist brethren to vote for John Adams, and John Adams, as soon as the Constitution was ratified, John Adams introduced 
the Bill of Rights and these ten amendments to the Constitution were added, and they have been a lifeguard to each one of us. The reason we can be here tonight and not have to fear, the reason we can sing these songs out that we've sung and have our lights burning brightly is because we have a First Amendment. England never had that. Germany, France, Spain, none of those countries. Italy, none of them had that. They were controlled by a church that was in hand in glove with the government. And so when folks say, well, Baptists aren't important. Yes, we are. And I've never liked the word proud. I don't say we're proud of who we are. I say we're thankful for who we are that the Lord has shown us the truth of his word and that we have been blessed in the way that we have. It is a real blessing to be a child of God. It is a real blessing to be a Baptist. And I remember I, w I spoke on this history for five nights up in northern Ohio and I've never tried to viciously attack the Roman Catholic Church. And this one man came to me afterwards. He was from Peru, and he had been saved and called to preach, and he said his dad had been saved. And he came up after the whole thing was over, and he says, Brother Duval, you are too easy on the Catholics. I said, what do you mean I was too easy on them? He said, when my dad was saved, the priest went down and told his boss to fire him the next day, and he lost his job. Now, that's the way some countries are run. And that was the power that the Roman Catholic Church had. Let's be grateful it's not that way here. I told him, I said, I don't want to ever attack Catholics individually, but their system is wrong. And we're going to see a little bit more of that. We're going to have a handout tomorrow to show how all of the various denominations sprung up and what they believe. Now, what we've got for everyone tonight, every family, is a little book, and this is again a Reader's Digest edition of The Origin of Baptist by Samuel H. Ford. It was written several years ago. It was in hardback for a long time. It's been reprinted in paperback, and it was economical enough that the church could get it, and you're going to get one free. And I hope that you'll read it, and I hope you'll learn from it, and it'll be a real blessing to you and your family. Thank you for your attention. I'll turn the service to Brother Bill.